Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, Near Infrared Fluorescent Guided Surgery for Brain Tumours. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You may have joined the presentation listening using your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the telephone, just select phone call in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed for you. We welcome your questions and you will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the questions pane found at the bottom of your attendee control panel. You can send in your questions at any time during the presentation and we'll collect them and address as many as we have time for during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. It's my great pleasure to introduce our presenter today, Dr. John Lee. Dr. Lee is Professor of Neurosurgery at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, PA. He has practiced at Penn for 15 years and is currently co-director for the Center for Precision Surgery, which has a goal of implementing intraoperative molecular imaging into surgical practice. He is also director of the Gamma Knife Radio Surgery Program and adjunct professor of ENT as he has a clinical focus on skull-based surgery. He started his education at Yale University and completed a med medical degree at Rutgers, New Jersey. He's trained in neurosurgery at the University of Pittsburgh and completed a fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic. Dr. Lee, over to you. All right, good morning. Uh, thank you for the uh, opportunity to uh, talk today. Um, please uh, feel free to ask questions during the meeting and our moderators will uh, be able to assist. So um, I'm gonna talk today about Tumor Glow, uh, which is a name we trademarked at Penn uh, for um, intraoperative molecular imaging in the near infrared. And um, this is the cover of the September issue of neurosurgery and um, fluorescence is a hot topic, a glowing topic, if you will. And um, I look forward to um, sharing our information our, and our results. So I'm gonna first start talking about glioblastoma. Glioblastoma, as we all know, is one of the most aggressive solid brain tumors in adults. It's the most uh, highly aggressive. Um, and when it presents like this with a butterf classic butterfly, it's a very, very poor prognosis. Um, even with maximal therapy, which is our conventional six weeks of radiation plus uh, oral temidar, our survival is measured in months. Um, one nice thing is we are starting to see two-year survivors, uh, at least maybe 20% of patients can live up to two years, but still it's a pretty dismal prognosis. Now, what is the role of surgery in this malignant disease? Um, in 2001, the MD Anderson group showed that if you can get 98% of that contrast enhancing tumor out, we can improve survival. So that again is measured by taking your MRI before surgery, giving them gadolinium, which is a contrast agent, leaks into the tumor, and then measuring how much tumor there was before, then doing the same thing after surgery, get an MRI, give them gadolinium, look at how much tumor is left based on the gadolinium enhancement, then you can show that 98% uh, resection of that gadolinium contrast enhancement improves survival. So same kind of thing. Now, 10 years later in 2011, they lowered the bar. Uh, another study from UCSF, uh, this is by Nader Sinai, showed that even if you resect 78% of the tumor, we can improve survival. So again, improving resection of the contrast enhancing portion of the high-grade glioma improves survival. So how do we find this tumor in the OR? And I thought that we just review this. So the classic is frameless stereotaxy. Um, you take an MRI the day before surgery or prior, and then register it to the patient's face, and then use that as your GPS in the OR. Of course, this is subject to lots of problems. Once you start taking out the tumor, there's deformation. This is not real-time information. This is information from yesterday. So it doesn't it gives you some information and a lot of information, but not all the information and certainly not real time. 
Here's an example of how the GPS system is used in the OR. And you can imagine as once this starts to take and you start to look at the margins, it can be very complicated. There's no randomized control studies to um, uh, support that use, but it is um, kind of st it is standard of care. Intraoperative MRI could give you and will give you real-time information, but the implementation of MRI in the operating room suite is complex. So for example, in this setup here, they move um, the patient into the MRI and then they uh, bring the patient back. Of course, the uh, requirements for no metal, et cetera, make it very, very complicated to do. Um, this uh, was a randomized control trial conducted out of Germany and it showed improvement in survival if you use the intra MRI. What we take from this is that it's too logistically difficult to, for all centers to have an intra MRI, but getting better resection uh, with you, the use of imaging helps and improves survival. However, in the systematic review, there is at best level two evidence um, uh, that this is um, supported. So now we turn to the gold standard in neurosurgery. And I really I credit Walt Stumer and the um, European groups for conducting this uh, phase three randomized control trial demonstrating the benefit of fluorescence. So in this case, this is a visible light fluorophore, 5-ALA is a prodrug that is converted in cells and retained as protoporphyrin 9, which when shined with either blue and uh, light, you can then see an emission in red. And using 5-ALA, um, Dr. Stumer was able to show that compared to white light alone, progression-free survival improves. Um, but again, look at the um, time in months. I mean, this is still a very, very aggressive disease, 12 months or progression-free survival being out here, not overall survival. Um, so 5 ALA is the current gold standard. Here's an example of a glioblastoma. You can see it somewhat presenting to the surface. You can see that if you shine with blue, here is the red, and there are the um, malignant tumor cells. So it took a while for this to be FDA approved in the United States, a decade, and I credit um, Steve Kalkanis, my friend Kostas Hadjapanias, and many others uh, for helping for that to get approved. It's now the gold standard. We use this, but I'm gonna show you data today that suggests that the use of ICG may be comparable. Um, and of course, it is much cheaper. So um, finding tumors can be so complicated that uh, Sami's, uh, Amir Sami here published a paper that he needed to use every tactic, the frameless stereotactic navigation, intraop MRI, and 5-ALA to get the best results. So I practice at Pennsylvania Hospital, first hospital in America. We have a surgical amphitheater up here at uh, the top floor. And I always, uh, I borrow this from Quen Nguyen, uh, who is a um, leader in this field and thought, a thought leader and head and neck surgeon. Um, and this first surgical amphitheater was used in from 1804 to 1868. This gaslight was only here in the 1830s. So it's in the top floor for a reason, because when you look up, there are these beautiful clay story lights. And you need all this light because surgery is the story of light. Surgery was only done at high noon because you need maximal visualization in order to uh, operate. And what's beautiful now is that we can not only look at um, white light, but we are now looking at the near infrared with cameras and sensors. Of course, I use microscopes, endoscopes, every technique to bring light to the field. But the technique I'm gonna describe is very similar to gadolinium enhancement. So every neurosurgeon recognizes the value of gadolinium. Here's a sagittal MRI of a patient with a tumor. You can see something is disrupted over here, but all you do is give gadolinium, it leaks into the tumor, the normal brain does not hold on to the gadolinium because it has such tight blood-brain barrier that it prevents gadolinium from per, per, uh, leaking into the, into the normal brain. And then the gadolinium sticks around for a while, long enough that you can get the uh, MRI and you can see the tumor. Boom, you give the gadolinium, it was FDA approved in 1988, and it's much ob more obvious how to see the tumor. Same thing, you can see something's disrupted here in the normal midbrain, give the gadolinium and it's very obvious. Same thing with this insular glioma I operated on. Give the gadolinium, here's a uh, parietal occipital GBM. So now if your contrast agent is gadolinium, well, that's only detected with MRI, but what if you can give a contrast agent that fluoresces in the near infrared? Well, one of the benefits of near infrared, is a longer wavelength. That longer wavelength allows me to see 
deeper. I can see through the cortex. I can see down into the um, uh, past normal tissue. And that's the real benefit of the near infrared. Visible light fluorophores can only penetrate maybe three millimeters, whereas with near infrared, I've published, we can definitely see a centimeter deep. So here I'm going to now turn on my fluorophore excitation light, in this case a laser, and then I'm going to look for emission at 830 nanometers and then overlay that image onto the white light and you can clearly see where the tumor is. And this accounts for all registration problems, even if CSF is drained or even if you've taken some tumor out, you can, that you can see the accumulation of fluorophore. Um, now, why are, another reason we're interested in near-infrared, because as you get longer and longer wavelengths, like our, our eyes can see about 400 to 700 nanometers, um, but there's a lot of um, contaminants in that region of the visible light spectrum that cause autofluorescence. Sometimes I see collagen, you can see lipopigments. Um, so this is a very, very messy, messy spectrum in, in which to visualize. It's much cleaner if you go out to 800. Um, so of the fluorophores that are used in neurosurgery, 5-ALA is excellent, but it's very dark. So your brightness is a product of your quantum yield. Your quantum yield is how many photons are emitted when you excite that particular fluorophore. And in this case, it's 8%. So eight of every fluorophore. Um, and it's brightness, you multiply by the molar extinction coefficient, coefficient, and you get a brightness of only 400. In contrast, ICG is 30 times brighter, and fluorescein actually is 200 times brighter, but fluorescein has issues because it's in the visible light. So we have dubbed this uh, technique the second window ICG, and the um, method of action we consider to be similar to enha the enhanced permeability and retention effect as described by Maeda et al. Uh, in Japan. So normal tissues have very tight endothelium and the gap junctions are very tight. So nanoparticles like ICG do not extravasate. Um, there's a very good um, uh, prevention, especially in the brain, there's a, ICG will not leak out. In tumors, however, because it does not form normal uh, vasculature, the ICG just leaks out and you get um, ICG accumulation in the tumor, that's enhanced permeability and then you get enhanced retention because the tumor also doesn't have normal clearance mechanisms. The brain we recently found, uh, discovered in Nature paper that um, the brain does have lymphatic drainage and indeed um, the lymphatic drainage of tumors are um, uh, askew. So we investigated this in mice first just to um, see if this works and here's our example of a flank uh, injection and you can clearly see this brain tumor that's uh, placed here as a xenograft uh, in the flank um, clearly um, demonstrates uh, ICG fluorescence and we demonstrated that has a long plateau you can window in a long period uh, we chose 24 hours because it's convenient because you do it that you inject it the day before and inject it and visualize the, the day after. Um, we uh, tested different uh, models. This is the GL261 glioma model. Um, it's not a human glioma model, but it is more infiltrative than the classic uh, U87, which I'll show. So you can see those um, more infiltrative margins. We also did uh, tested U87, which tends to form more spherical balls, although the biology may more replicate um, uh, human tissue because it's derived from a human patient. Now, 5-ALA will not fluoresce in necrotic areas. So you can see that uh, here at the margin, um, you get 5-ALA fluorescence, but nothing in the necrosis, whereas actually ICG is more preferentially retained in necrotic areas. So um, ICG has some advantages in this respect. Now, before we went on to humans, we studied very carefully where autofluorescence uh, in the different areas. Here's ICG in a normal, um, this is no, no, uh, no dye, so we're just looking in the uh, near infrared, and this is just our uh, diffraction artifact. But in normal um, brain, even with a tumor, when you give no dye, 5-ALA, you can see some fluorescence. So you have to be careful how you interpret uh, visible light fluorophores. Now, ICG, um, in, in a no tumor, there are normal structures that will hold on to ICG, especially the choroid plexus. In 5-ALA, we have the same issues with the hippocampal formation and the ependymal walls. You have to be careful. Um, so 
With ICG imaging, I uh, really credit Sunil Singhal, my colleague in thoracic surgery, who um, started this whole project uh, over a decade ago. Here is his prototype near-infrared camera that was used in an open chest that I used for several of my early cases for near-infrared uh, visualization. Ultimately, though, I relied on um, Alicia D'Souza and Brian Pogue's work from Dartmouth to choose the camera with the highest sensitivity for the lowest concentrations of fluorophore and the widest dynamic range, thus allowing for best visualization. And uh, we compared this to our camera, our standard intraoperative microscope, and um, we found that the standard intraoperative microscopes are lacking. So here is an example of increasing fluorophore concentrations using standard micro neurosurgical microscope versus the best uh, commercially available ICG visualization platform. And you can see the difference in, in signal to background. And then of course, as you get higher concentrations, doesn't necessarily mean you see better because uh, you get quenching of the fluorophore. So there's an optimal amount of dye that you want in your tumor for visualization. This is the system I use. It's an exoscope and an endoscope version. Now, as I progress to surgery in the operating room, you realize that there's actually near-infrared contamination everywhere. Um, so these stereotactic navigation systems that shine and bathe the surface with near-infrared are very bad for my work because I, it, you'll see flickering. This thing is shooting near-infrared light that we can't see with our eyes, but contaminate the field with flickering near infrared in order to detect these stereotactic reflective balls. Um, so uh, I had to change the system out for a competitor's ver a different version that shoots near infrared the other way from the field out. Second thing, sunlight has plenty of near infrared in it. So um, I had to install double uh, double uh, uh, shades in order to um, shield the uh, uh, surgical field from near-infrared. Now, the dye that I'm using is simple, boring, old ICG. ICG is, has very many great properties. Now, most of us are very, very familiar with ICG as a video angiography agent. Basically, you ask the anesthesiologist to give it and you look at the vasculature. Now, in that bolus method, within a few minutes of visualization, you only see the vasculature. And the sensitivity of the current systems, like the surgical microscopes, works fine because the ICG is bound to serum albumin like proteins, and there's enough of it in the, um, in the vessel wall uh, that you can uh, see that fluorophore. However, for tumor visualization, I've been giving much higher doses at 5 mg per kilo and 2.5 mg per kilo. Currently, ICG is FDA approved up to 2 mg per kilo. So this has all been done under IRB protocol. And that, so we give 5 mg per kilo and then we wait uh, a day before we operate. So we've called this the second window ICG or tumor glow. So here's an example of the surgery. And I credit Claire uh, Tang who put this uh, video together. Now, this is a very simple uh, case. It's a meningioma, but you can clearly see her normal brain. This is the dura, which is the covering of the brain. And now we're gonna look in the near infrared channel, which is just, in this case, just put as black and white. And you can clearly see the retention of fluorophore in the tumor and the tumor comes from the dura, but not in the brain. So now we can do a pseudo color overlay where the system just overlays and color maps um, the near infrared channel to the visual and then um, continue operating. So you can see here, I'm trying to work around this tumor. And um, as we wash away the blood, the blood can block some of the um, fluorophore. Uh, just, uh, and you can see it's stuck in the tumor and the tumor's all out. So this is um, a very robust technique. And now I'll show you some of the um, some of our results. So we started this protocol with Dr. Seagal, um, my uh, friend and colleague in 2014. We started, opened our new protocol just for a CNS tumors in 2015. And we've since closed this study in 2019. Um, we've enrolled 374 patients. Um, I, I want to also thank Dr. Brem, who has helped uh, accrue a lot of the glioblastoma patients. Um, ultimately, we injected um, 354 patients uh, after uh, some um, 
So again, five mg per kilo or 2.5 mg per kilo injected over an hour. We take vital signs every five minutes. And um, so at that super high dose, which is not FDA approved, what are the adverse events? This is unpublished data. Um, we have 5.7% incidence of hypertension, 7% incidence of arm discomfort, some headache. Now we had one severe hypertension early in the experience that we sent to the ER. And once you stop the administration, the, the, bl the blood pressure comes back to normal. But in the beginning, we were unsure, we were still learning. And um, uh, we've had no uh, serious adverse events since we slowed down the infusion. So now, back to high-grade glioma, glioblastoma. Uh, Bo Biden, John McCain, Ted Kennedy have all died from this tumor. Um, you give the gadolinium, you can see the tumor, you have a thin layer of cortex. I can see through the normal brain. This is the beauty of this technique. I can see through the normal brain. So we turn on the camera, do the pseudo-color overlay. There's a the tumor. I trust this more than navigation now. I know exactly where to make my cordisectomy, the shortest path to get this tumor out. Once the um, tumor is grossly out, um, I'm just using standard techniques, I then look at my margins and I find this, I biopsy this, take a specimen and then send it to pathology. I, in this study, uh, 354 patients, we did not change the extent of resection based on um, the absence or presence or absence of uh, glioma. So, um, so what have we concluded from this? So 80 patients with high-grade gliomas, and the signal-to-background ratio is very high, 5.8. Um, so this is a very robust technique. The signal-to-background actually is much higher than um, uh, protoporphyrin 9 uh, in comparison. Um, then, uh, so some of the clinical benefits, even if the dura is closed, I haven't even seen the brain yet, um, I can see through the floor, uh, see the tumor, see the floor for accumulation in the glioblastoma um, even before the uh, dura is open. If this tumor is close enough to the surface, this signal background is 3.5. And then when you open the cortex, you get 4.8 uh, and um, gets even higher uh, to five if you once you actually see the tumor. So once I include all the biopsy margin specimens, which is 137 specimens, I have a sensitivity of 94, specificity of 54, a PPV of 95, and an NPV of 50. Now, how does that compare to our gold standard of 5-ALA? So I want to credit um, our 5-ALA uh, colleagues um, for Alan Ezrin for posting this on the internet so that we can compare how he was able to get FDA approval in 2017. So the FDA approved this dye based on three European pivotal studies. And the surgeons went to the FDA and argued that the only value that matters to them is the positive predictive value. In high-grade glioma, what is the positive predictive if the If the tumor fluoresce, if the if something fluoresces, what is the chance that this is tumor? So in these three pivotal studies, um, the PPV was uh, high, greater than 95%. Our technique is very similar. 95%. Now, where, um, and just compared to literature, uh, our technique is still very high. Now, where our technique differs and maybe is an improvement upon 5-ALA is that when you compare the negative predictive value, so if there is no fluorescence, what is the chance that there is high-grade glioma if you biopsy that sample? With 5-ALA, because it's a weak fluorophore and because it relies on enzymatic conversion, which is an unclear uh, phenomenon as to why that happens, the negative predictive value of 5-ALA is 25%. That means if you biopsy a non-fluorescing area, three out of four times, 75%, it'll still be tumor. Um, so it, it, it's, a, it's a challenge to understand how this was uh, necessarily approved, but our technique, at least based on my small study of 80 patients, we have a positive, a negative predictive value of at least 50%, which is better than 5-ALA. And again, just doing a review of the literature, we just place this into context. So based on PPV and NPV, I think this is an excellent technique, um, just using ICG, which is cheaper than 5-ALA and perhaps more readily available. Now, of course, you could, there is a, um, just using test characteristics are alone are a challenge because this is not random sampling. The surgeons are often unwilling to biopsy every negative, every area in the brain once the resection is. So there are, are challenges. But one thing I want to say is that 5-ALA, how does it even get to the tumor? 
And in several papers by Walt Stumer uh, in, and, and others in the um, in Novotny in the past, 5-ALA relies on a broken blood-brain barrier to get to the tumor. So, and once it gets there, then it's enzymatically converted. So I believe that ICG has the advantage in that it doesn't require that enzymatic conversion. Its method of delivery is probably very similar to 5-ALA and it doesn't require that extra enzymatic step. So in, in, in end, it's a brighter dye. So there are some advantages to using ICG in our second window ICG technique. Now here are some, here's an example of a patient to 76% with confusion, aphasia, here's her tumor. And I uh, just wanna compare just what we see when we deliver 5-ALA at standard doses versus ICG 2.5 mg per kilo um, the day before. So here's the uh, Dura view. Um, with ICG, you can actually see through the Dura, find where it's closest to the surface. Um, with 5-ALA, you're not gonna be able to see through the Dura. So we'll see that in a second. Um, so. Uh, in fact, I didn't, I didn't even show it because it, you know it's not going to show anything. Um, so with 5-ALA here, you do see that enzymatic conversion. Um, so that's um, nice. You can see that red uh, and pink um, color. Here's the ICG view. So similar. Um, so the technique so far looks pretty similar. And then we um, continue. You can, now ICG, near-infrared can be put in any color, right? It's just a, it doesn't have a color. So that's just a pseudo uh, color over, overlay. So now I'm going to proceed with resection using white light, using standard microscopes. And let me just uh, kind of continue on. This is standard techniques, trying to take out as much tumor as possible. Now here's the tumor, here's gross um, fluorescence. So you can see that it looks very similar. There's near-infrared dye, ICG, in this specimen, and there's uh, 5-ALA. And now we start to do biopsies of specimens. And this is where we don't yet have a lot of data but we are finding that there are some differences, especially because 5-ALA has some false positives and appendable wall. ICG will have false positives and choroid plexus. Um, and so we will start to compare and contrast and look at our data. So you can see there's some pink over here. I didn't biopsy it because of, uh, I know that that's just a appendable wall. Um, so so we, we, we still have, we don't have that um, we just submitted that for publication and it was just accepted, um, but that's, uh, it's still early, early information. But again, I think ICG has a role um, and it may be very similar and may, may actually be a little bit better than 5-ALA. Now, if uh, ICG relies on gadolinium, can we use it to predict the post-op MRI? So the M is just, here's just to say that MRI is very important for uh, assessing extent of resection. So here's a tumor of GBM, here's what it looks like at ICG. Here's after resection, maybe some fuzzy, flore fuzzy fluorescence here and fuzzy enhancement post-op. So we're able to predict that post-op MRI. Here's another tumor, it looks like that. Here's the uh, pre-op. And then we, after resection, you just look and you can see tumor, you can see fluorescence, you can see contrast enhancement in the post-op MRI. This is obtained, this MRI is usually obtained the next day. So the gold standard for extent of resection is your post-op MRI, and our technique can predict the post-op MRI. So we published that as well with a, it has a very high sensitivity and specificity for predicting the post-op MRI. Now, the beauty of our technique because it doesn't require this enzymatic conversion step like 5-ALA, it can be used with any contrast-enhancing tumor. Brain metastasis is the obvious place to test this because brain mets are more common than GBM and um, we operate on a lot of them. So now for a patient like this, multiple tumors, they get radiosurgery or they get whole brain. Um, for a patient like this, symptomatic single metastasis, this we're gonna operate on. So um, now even with the best surgery, there's a 50% one year recurrence if you don't treat with post-op radiation. My contention is maybe with second window ICG, we can improve upon that. We can um, eliminate the need for post-op resection if we can predict that we've gotten a GTR, a gross total resection. So we did the same thing, 55 patients with brain mets. Our signal to background ratio is even brighter, six. Uh, six. Same thing, you can see through the dura, you can see through the normal cortex to take the tumor out. Now our sensitivity is very high, 98, but our specificity drops. Specificity drops because the disease prevalence is not as high. Our PPV is 86 and our NPV is 75, but 
Compared to 5-ALA, which for some tumors doesn't even work, this is better. So here's a video, an example of a lung cancer met. So we turn on the uh, camera, you can see clearly where the tumor is. Um, same thing, we turn on the camera, we can see the tumor over here. One thing I wanna comment is, we are trying to center the craniotomy over directly over the tumor. But one thing you may have noticed is that every single time we're off by a little bit, which is why we have to make our, our craniotomies a reasonable size. And this is the challenge of navigation. Even though we use the state-of-the-art stereotactic navigation systems, we can be off by a centimeter or two, just so you have to open bigger. But now imagine if you could see this through the skin. And so that is actually another area that we're we're interested in is how can we see uh, ICG near infrared fluorescence even deeper than just through, imagine if you could see it through the skull. So this is um, uh, other uh, very interesting areas of research. So again, just uh, resecting this tumor. And in this case, it's a met. So metastases have very much easier borders and they're different, totally different consistency than the surrounding brain. So you can um, just use a more uh, grosser technique to um, uh, shell it out. And so on block, this is very different than a GBM. So there we go. And then we have some residual and then we start biopsying that. So now another area where I've used this is benign tumors. Now benign tumors are not infiltrative. Margin dissection is not as critical, but it still works. And for meningiomas, this is what's uh, really remarkable. Um, and we found, again, a very high sensitivity. Our specificity is not great, but our PPV and NPV are reasonable. I've used it for, uh, for pituitary adenomas as well. A very similar story, very highly sensitive, but not so specific, decent PPV and NPV. And then I've used it for a whole host of other tumors, and uh, we've published on this as well. Um, these are our series of publications using our technique. So why am I so enthralled by ICG? Well, number one, this paper suggests that ICG may actually not just be in the tumor parenchyma or the interstitium of the tumor. It may be actually uptaken into the cell through an endocytotic mechanism. So in this colon cancer uh, model, they showed that um, ICG is intracellularly located, and if you apply an endocytic blockade, a chemical blockade, you can stop that ICG um, fluorescence. Fluorescein does not do that. They did not show, find that fluorescein um, uh, ends up in the intracellular location. Instead, it just stays extracellular. And I think that it may explain why fluorescein, when you compare fluorescence technique with fluorescein, it just looks like it's spilling. The other interesting thing about ICG, and I alluded to this earlier, is that our current ICG technique our, and near-infrared cameras um, truncate at around 1,200 nan or 10,000 nanometers. You don't see anything after certain wavelength. So our silicone-based sensors, CMOS, CCD, all do not see past uh, a certain wavelength. However, these indium gallium arsenide, uh, um, arsenic cameras are able to see much longer wavelengths. The price of these shortwave infrared um, uh, camera sensors have come way down, primarily because of self-driving cars. So for example, if you're a car, you need a camera so you can see what's ahead of you. But imagine if you had a shortwave, uh, this type of camera where you can see even further than what's visible. So you're not blocked, but so that way you could see the car ahead of you. So um, this is um, the idea behind uh, why these sensors have come down in price. And one thing is when you take ICG and you just look at it um, in using these special, these newer um, cameras, you find that there's a peak of emission way out at 15, 1600 nanometers. Now this wavelength is so clean that there's no contamination by biologic structures. So this PNAS paper um, from the uh, Harvard and MIT group, uh, Mass General Group, they show that the vasculature is even clearer using um, longer, the shortwave uh, infrared. And ICG is actually excellent for this. So we've already, um, now the uh, Chinese researchers, Ji Tian, they already employed this in a human case uh, and they published this in um, liver tumor surgery. So they created a camera 
that can see the near infrared one spectrum, which is just our standard 805 nanometer excitation, and but instead our 830 nanometer excitation, but they also use uh, the indium gallium arsenide um, shortwave uh, sensors to look into the NIR2. And with that, they were able to show better sensitivity, better tumor detection, better signal to background ratio using the NIR2 window. So it's a very exciting area. We are actively pursuing this um, and look forward to more research in that, that area. So um, I, in summary, I'm very excited by our technique of using near-infrared fluorophores, simple, old, boring ICG to localize, to identify tumors in brain. The brain has a very clean background. Um, we hosted a, uh, our Center for Precision Surgery uh, course two years ago, and we're planning to host this again in November 6, 2020. Um, I invite you all, please, to um, participate. And whether it will be in person or socially distanced or a combination thereof with uh, uh, online, uh, we will see. But um, I want to thank you all for uh, listening and participating, and I hope I stayed on time. I'll take any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee, and you're perfectly on time. So we are now going to begin answering the questions that have been submitted so far during the presentation. But as a reminder, you can still submit your questions through the questions pane in your attendee control panel. And our first question is, um, I understand not modifying the extent of the um, resection based on lack of presence of ICG at the margin. However, you mentioned biopsying the margin. Can you discuss the results or content of those biopsies? Yeah, so the data I presented um, kind of lumps the margin with the um, with the uh, gross tumor. Um, let me find that slide. So here, for example, we had 80 patients, but we have 137 margin specimens. And that this, these are the results of including both the gross tumor and the margin specimen. Now, in our publications, we've also broken it out by margins only um, and the sensitivity specimen, but we just don't have actually that many samples. And part of this gets back to the unwillingness of surgeons to just take random biopsy samples. I mean, there are some cases where I'm very heavily interested and I have time and I might take five biopsy samples, but there are other cases where you're too much in eloquent cortex, it's just too dangerous, you're kind of nervous to take two uh, biopsy specimens. So um, that's why the number of specimens are not, um, are not as uh, perhaps as high. It'd be, it would be much better if we got, for example, 10 specimens per, 10 margin specimens per case. If we were to do this, um, this was a prospective study, um, but it was also in many ways just kind of learning the technique because um, no one's ever done this in the near infrared before um, in brain. I mean, every fluorophore uh, hitherto has been visible light fluorophore. Um, it's exciting now. There's um, we're, we're gaining. Uh, I'm curious to see, for example, some of the runs results with the chlorotoxin. Uh, study that's um, being done in pediatric medulloblastomas. Um, and Amy Lee from Seattle has come and presented at our course in 2018. I'm very excited uh, with um, Alco Nano has a uh, pH sensitive dye which um, encapsulated its ICG. And so we'll see um, uh, some of those results as well. But honestly, I think in, in, um, in brain, um, the blood brain barrier and the disruption of that BBB is really the main mechanism of delivery of all these dyes. And I suspect that some of the results of these studies are just going to be very, even with tumor specificity. So, for example, Eben Rosenthal published a paper with his colleagues, uh, Gordon Lee, uh, where he took his uh, cetuximab antibody conjugated to IRDI 800 and demonstrated in three patients that there is signal in the tumor. Well, that is pretty easy to achieve. I can achieve that by just giving ICG, or if you could, you could give na raw naked iodine 800 and um, get, get it into the tumor. But um, its degree of specificity, I, I call, uh, it will be interesting to, to see. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, our next question, can you explain your imaging setup in the operating room? Microscope versus exoscope versus endoscope? Yeah, so one of the challenges in the operating room is um, some tools are better for certain aspects of the surgery. So uh, for conventional white light, it's very hard to beat the conventional operating microscope. The major, the optics, the illumination of standard microscopes are excellent. They're, um, they've been fine-tuned over 50 to 100 years. Um, the coatings on the glass are excellent for white light. And, um, uh, and they provide stereo stereoscope, stereoscopic vision plus magnification plus illumination. So I have to use the microscope for the bulk of this actual surgery. However, um, their near infrared capabilities are pretty poor. And in fact, even their fluorescence in the visible light, even with 5 ALA, is not ideal. Um, and it can definitely be improved. In fact, with 5-ALA alone, if you just put the standard microscope, turn on the blue light excitation, which is just filtered xenon, and then look in the ocular, then look with your eyes, I can see more fluorophore and red with just my naked eye than I can through the ocular of the primary surgeon with the, in the microscope. Um, so there are challenges to, um, to optimizing visualization of fluorophore. And in the near infrared, that is compounded more because very little light gets to the near, gets to the camera sensor of a standard operating microscope uh, because so many of the photons have already been split, beam split to go to prioritize the actual surgeons looking with their eyes. So not enough light gets to the camera. And then with not enough light and with cameras not um, optimized for near infrared, we have a significant loss of imaging um, uh, sensitivity. Now, the exoscopes have advantages in that regard because the exoscopes capture all the light into their imaging sensor, and that's why some of those have advantages. But now here I am with a microscope for one part of the surgery, then I pull that out and I bring in the exoscope to look for the near infrared, but that's not perfectly registered to what I could see. And now with the exoscopes, that's all fine and good. I'm looking up on a screen, but I don't have three dimensions. So even sometimes trying to find that glowing specimen, margin specimen is not actually that easy because I'm looking on the screen, I'm trying to biopsy the margin specimen, and I can't actually physically get to it. I don't know if it's deep. I don't know if it's, uh, and so, so there are challenges there. So all of this will improve, and this is a great opportunity for companies to improve upon their, um, their systems. And ICG is fantastic because it's already FDA approved. Um, so this can be, um, and it will serve as an easy proxy for all of the new fluorophores that are coming out. I mean, there, and one thing what we love about our um, course is that we invite every company with any, who are already in patients um, to present, uh, we ask the surgeons and the researchers to come and present um, their initial preliminary results. And I get exposure to every single, hopefully tumor specific dye um, that uh, has potential in imaging and providing uh, value uh, for patients. So it's been a very exciting, exciting process. Thank you very much. So moving on to our next question here, how is the false color overlay applied over a seemingly normal looking color um, video image if very dark conditions are required for NIR detection? So every camera uh, company has their own solution to this. Um, I know that um, the a white light image is, um, I guess the question is, uh, so for example, it's not, I'm shutting off all the lights in the OR, but that does not mean that the camera system has shut off their lights. So, if the camera system can filter their light just to up to about 700, 750 nanometers, well, there won't be any cross-contamination into the near infrared. 
And then if you have a different excitation source for the ICG, they're probably doing some method of capturing white light separate from near infrared. Now, how each system does it is, I think, proprietary or up to their engineers. I have seen some systems that are flickering. Um, they're just going on, back on, on and off, um, uh, and they're alternating modes. And some are doing it simultaneously. But this is um, a, a camera engineering. Part of it is how much information is needed, um, how fast. So do you need to do 30 frames per second um, in the visible and then alternate that at 30 frames per second in the near infrared? I, I don't know. I, I leave this up to the engineers as to what specific method they want to do. And every company is approaching it uh, differently. Thank you. There was a second part to that question about what wavelength of NAR, NIR are involved. Well, ICG is um, peak excitation at 805 nanometers and then emission at approximately 830 nanometers. Um, so the stoke shift is pretty small, only 25 nanometers. Contrast that with 5 ALA, for example, the peak excitation I think is around 400 and the emission is at 700. So that's a huge stoke shift of uh, 300 some nanometers. Um, so uh every every fluorophore will be different so for example otl38 on targets um, folate dye is slightly different than icg and that's just because of its chemical uh, uh, composition and i believe that that excitation source is uh, more in the 830 nanometers so i know that for that trial they have specifically um, outfitted the camera systems uh, to peak in, in the um, uh, closer to the max uh, absorption or excitation uh, peak for uh, their particular fluorophore. So it raises an interesting question, which is what is the right um, wavelength and how do you design your camera system to be future-proof? And I think um, right now you know, in the old systems, they just took filtered xenon and just used it for everything because it has a very wide range. Um, but I think maybe what we're seeing is that some of the, um, it, it just may not have enough, because um, I, I, I definitely benefit from using laser excitation at 805, because the excitation power, especially when you go down to endoscopes, where you have limited ability to capture, um, because the imaging area is so small, I really need very efficient sensors and very effective uh, and powerful excitation light sources. LEDs obviously is a whole nother area. I, I, I know that that's very exciting. I know I think Quest uses LEDs. I think maybe the Stryker um, Novadac systems are using LEDs and I'm still learning myself, which is the optimal uh, system for, for camera. Thank you very much. So uh, the next question, I hope I understand it correctly. It says, I understand ICG infusion by IV. Is it cross BBB um, for human or animals? And there's a follow up part to that. Um, do you need a higher dose to reach the brain through crossing BBB? So, um... We started at five mg per kilo. Let me see if, uh, you know, I don't have any of my dose, um, dose slides. Uh, we, we have actually studied the difference between what our results are between five mg per kilo versus 2.5 mg per kilo, and um, we're submitting that for publication, but I don't have that slide. Uh, I, we do see a very small signal drop off when we come down in um, dose, um, but I believe that there's a lot of opportunity to improve and optimize dose for brain. I think what, what is key in brain, and this is not true in other areas of the body, but in brain in particular, the blood-brain barrier is so tight and so effective at preventing these charged molecules from crossing that, um, or these polar molecules from crossing, that we may not need super high doses um, because our background is very, very clean. Um, 
Now, other parts of the body, the background may be very dirty because it has uh, other roles and functions, but in the brain, it does not want or allow much to cross. I mean, obviously, this is also a problem for uh, drug delivery to brain, um, and this has been a problem thwarting chemotherapeutic options for brain tumors for a long time, but we are taking advantage of it because the gross tumor that enhances with gadolinium already has a permeable blood-brain barrier that is not normal because it's not brain, it's tumor. And the angiogenic um, effects of the tumor are, have created a disruptive, abnormal vasculature. I hope that answers that question. Thank you very much. And being conscious of time, we'll just take another couple of questions. Um, the first one is, do you need something more than ICG to be able to see this color in the dura? For instance, microscope filters or special glasses? Huh. Okay, so sorry, I didn't review fluorescence um, in the beginning. Um, I could do that. Uh, uh, so I, I published a, a review paper on this and precisely because I knew that many of my colleagues and myself actually are still, okay. Number one, chromophores. Chromophores, imagine, is like paint. So if I paint like this tie, this tie is red. Why is it? It has a chromophore that absorbs every other wavelength except red. It reflects red. So the wavelength of red, around 700 nanometers, 750, it reflects. So that chromophore, that dye, um, is a chemical that when you shine it with white light, which has every wavelength, it absorbs everything except the red. That's why I see it as red. So chromophores are working off of reflectance. Our eyes are accustomed to reflectance. You're, the sun has, and our bulbs have white light. It bathes the surface in white light, and the chromophore will absorb everything except the, the uh, reflected wavelength, and that way, reflected wavelength is what you see as that particular color. Now, fluorescence is completely different. Fluorescence, there's a fluorophore, so this molecule has, it, gets excited by a particular wavelength. So once it's excited, it then drops back down, but in its process of being dropping back down to a particular uh, energy level, it emits this, this wavelength of emits energy, and the energy is perceived in this case as light um, because it's emitting that particular wavelength of light. So, in this case of, um, so in the case of 5-ALA or protoporphyrin 9, more correctly, protoporphyrin 9, you have to excite it at 400, and then when it comes back down, it emits the 700 nanometer light that you can see as red. It, so in the near infrared, the same thing is being done. We're exciting at 805 and we're detecting at 830, but you can't see that process because it's not a visible wavelength to the human eye. In 5-ALA, you can because you just shine it with blue and then you look for a very long, you just look for the red. Um, but there are other fluorophores as well, um, like fluorescein, for example. Fluorescein is just so bright and such an effective flow that just you just take regular light, white light, and you'll just start to see this um, green color or yellowish green. So. I hope that explains um, some of the principles of fluorescence. So then getting back to the cameras, every in order for me to see near infrared, I need two parts. I need to excite the fluorophore and I need to capture its emission. So fortunately, every camera sensor, even this uh, phone camera sensor can detect near infrared unless it's fi been filtered. Um, and um, so you can detect uh, the emission, but you need something to excite it. And that all depends. Every camera system is coming out with different ways of doing that. 
Thank you very much. And moving swiftly on to another question, um, could you just discuss a little bit about more on the types of tumours that were included in your study? Were they all HG uh, gliomas? No, um, as I um, mentioned, um, so for example, we uh, did 55 brain mets, metastases as well. We also did benign tumors. We did 77 meningiomas. We um, did, injected 36 pituitary adenomas. We did schwannomas, cordomas, low-grade astrocytomas, olfactory chondrosarcomas, lymphoma. I mean, we did a whole potpourri. Everything that I could think, anything that was going to surgery, I, I enrolled them. And just to learn, I wanted to learn where it would work, why it would work. And for example, in the low-grade astrocytomas, they have no conscious enhancement. There's no gadolinium enhancement. They are, by definition, these are the non-enhancing gliomas. We had no dye uptake whatsoever. We published an early version of this, I think in 2016 or 17, and we're gonna be updating that paper um, soon. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. And before we end the webinar today, could I just ask you to move to your slide that had the dates of the events that you were mentioning at the end of your presentation? I think we had a timeline. Is that what you're referring to? I think it was the, the dates of the event that you had coming up. You were mentioning a... Oh, yeah. November... 2020, November 6, 2020. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So that is all the time that we have for questions today. And it just leaves me to thank you, Dr. Lee, for your fabulous presentation and for staying with us to answer all of those questions. If there are any questions that we haven't been able to get to, you, we will follow up with you after the webinar. Once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation. So we would be grateful if you could keep your browser window open at the end and complete that and provide your feedback for us. You will also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours that will include a link to view a recording of today's webinar. On behalf of the International Society of Fluorescence Guided Surgery with grant funding from Diagnostic Green, and our presenter, Dr. Lee, thank you so much for joining us and please do enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye.